But yes, I wanted to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I live and work on, which here in Canberra are the Ngunnawal and Ngunnawal people. Um, and their lands have never been ceded. Um, so welcome to the Synapse seminar series. So this is run in the School of Culture, History and Language here at ANU and is part of the Evolution of Cultural Diversity initiative. Um, and we have the aim of encouraging conversations across disciplines, um, particularly with, in taking perspectives on understanding the human past and also the present. Um, and it's really wonderful to have Daniela Hoffman and Martin Puholt speaking today. And I'm going to pass over to Kate to introduce them. Hi, um, I'm also uh, coming to you from Nanawal and Nambri country, and I pay my respect to their elders past and present. Um, I, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Daniela and Martin. Uh, Daniela Hoffman is a professor of archaeology at the University of Bergen and a specialist broadly in the European Neolithic, including the use of isotopic and genetic data to delineate social practices in prehistory. She's one of European archaeology's leading specialists in the archaeologies of migration and has authored numerous book chapters and journal articles and coordinated a double handful of significant edited volumes on a range of topics from house structures to deposition practices. Uh, she's also let me drag her into all manner of polemical nonsense, for which I am deeply grateful. Uh, Martin Fuchholz holds a professorship in protohistoric archaeology and social archaeology at the Institute of Pre- and Protohistoric Archaeology, the Roots Cluster of Excellence at Christian Albrecht University in Kiel, Germany. Uh, his work also spans much of the European Neolithic, and he's a recognized leading specialist in the later prehistory of Central and Northern Europe. In recent years, he's focused primarily on developing more complex archaeological models of the third millennium BC cordedware complex and the integration of genetic data into traditional models of social change and social confirmation in the past. Over the last year, the two of them have co-directed the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters Center for Advanced Study Project, exploring the archaeological migration narrative, the introduction of farming and animal husbandry in southern Norway. This project brings together a range of interdisciplinary specialists in order to bring the Norwegian Neolithic into dialogue with wider European trends and to build a complex interpretive framework that bridges traditional archaeological data and new scientific information about the past. Thank you very much, both of you, for coming. Uh, thank you. That, that was a really nice introduction. <laughs> Not that I'm surprised or anything. Um, shall we just start then? Um, so I'll share my screen. Is that, is that working for everyone? OK, super. Um, so thank you all for turning up today um, to listen to us uh, tell you about a project that Kate was alluding to, um, which is Today, broadly, we're going to come from a politics of migration angle. Uh, but as mentioned, all this is part of a wider project that we're currently running at the Center of Advanced, for, for Advanced Studies in Oslo. And so it's for us to thank them for their uh, generous funding in allowing us to be there um, and run various workshops and um, bring together uh, a nice uh, team the project as a whole is called Exploring the Archaeological Migration Narrative, and we do have a focus on introducing farming and animal husbandry in southern Norway. Um, but there comes a wider background uh, to rethinking migration narratives uh, in archaeology and in Neolithic archaeology more broadly, and this is what we're going to talk about um, today. And even though you see just the two of us here, this is definitely a much bigger team behind us, um, so we'd like to acknowledge them here. Um, who've worked with us on both the more archaeogenetic side and the more uh, theoretical and archaeological side. Um, so if you have time afterwards, uh, feel free to check out all their various profile on the CAS uh, website. Um, okay, so what we'll do today is just to give you a very brief run through the late third millennium migration narrative in, in Europe, uh, just for those of you who might have been blissfully unaware, um, or at least semi untouched uh, by the controversies that have raged uh, about that. Um, and then briefly discuss why it's not quite satisfactory, uh, both in the light of new data of the last two or three years, which have substantially modified um, the narrative that we were uh, starting to build up in even just 2010, uh, 2015. Okay, 
um, and also still quite unsatisfactory in, in terms of the archaeological concepts and theories that are behind it. And we're going to argue for the importance of very different scales of social and political action. So not just the large scale that we've been used to, but to look really down at the decision making processes of smaller communities and even individuals where we can. Um, so that's the second half of the paper. So the third millennium um, in Europe is the very uh, end of the Neolithic, the beginning of the uh, Copper Age and eventually Bronze Age coming afterwards. Uh, and there's been over the last few years, a dominant narrative uh, evolving, uh, sort of mostly shaped by maybe Christian Christiansen, you might have read his article in Antiquity in 2017, um, but also by a big genetic narrative. Uh, David Reich has been involved in this in various other labs. Um, that there has been around about 2800 BC, a massive influx of new genetic signatures from the Pontic step, uh, transforming the societies of Europe forever and sort of sweeping all before it. And this dominant narrative is based on a few central tenets um, that have sort of become established into a coherent picture, very, very similar uh, to what in effect uh, Maria Gimwood has proposed uh, way back when uh, in, you know, in the post-war period uh, as, as the end of old Europe and the emergence of the Indo-Europeans. Um, so the first big idea is that this, this new migration is carried effectively by aggressive males. So Goldberg and others uh, in, in their uh, analysis of genetic data uh, found a large sex biased uh, influx. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but here from the steps that there were many, many more males were represented by the blue arrows than there were females, in contrast to earlier Neolithic expansions. Um, that has since been much debated uh, among geneticists, but it's sort of still very much uh, alive in the public imagination and in most archaeologists' head, it's fair to say, um, that this was driven largely by men who stormed into Europe um, and created a, a line of devastation. So mass graves have been published from this period, like this one here from Poland by Hannes Schröder and others. Um, but that afterwards, um, once these new male uh, warrior elite is established, um, it's mostly then women who move on marriage. And these women um, can come from the local communities. So we have this idea that male warriors move in, take local wives, so to speak, and that then it's these wives who move to their new locations. Um, Alongside this warrior identity is, is celebrated in a new burial rite that involves um, burial of individuals richly furnished under mounds with a very, very strict uh, gender rule in terms of positions and orientations, as you can see in this picture, sort of males on their right hand side, females on their left, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But generally, the central interments are supposed to be these male warriors buried with their drinking gear and with these fantastic uh, polished stone axes that you see um, on the picture there. And this burial rite was said to have its roots in the Yamnaya culture of the Russian steppes. But this actually, if you look at it in detail, remains rather floppily defined. You know, and these burials in Central Europe that are part of the corded ware horizon don't actually look very much like the Yamnaya burials of the Russian steppes, which are much more likely to be unfurnished and certainly hardly ever um, have any polished stone axes in them. So whatever it is, it's not a transfer of the Yamnaya culture, but it's often by a kind of slay of hand um, has become that um, in, in the dominant narrative. So as we said, these warriors then marry local women and the term marry in these archeological and, and genetic papers sort of covers a multitude of sins, uh, by, by hook or by crook, obtain uh, local women and then introduce um, very basic new social formations. So for example, it's been argued that the idea of the nuclear family, um, so that there is a sort of uh, central couple and they and just, just them and their children would form sort of the, the basic building block of society. Um, that's been argued, for example, on the basis of a mass grave in Eulau in uh, central, central Eastern Germany. That's dated to the early corded where um, and where a man and a woman were buried together with their biological children and they've been violently uh, killed. Um, it's often forgotten that other graves in the same cemetery contain, you know, also several individuals, but that can be more characterized as patchwork families. So you may have some people that are biologically related and others that are not or only partly sort of 
you know, maybe a, they're, they're classed as adopted sons or paternal aunts or all these things. So other social formations seem to exist uh, in this community, but this grave 99 has become the one that's, uh, that's been, you know, um, spread through all the media and has told us now from the arrival of the court where we have the bourgeois Central European family established. Um, it's also argued that we see a big economic change at this time with the arrival of um, mounted um, warriors so on horseback and that they also introduced then um, a new kind of mobile pastoralism based on um, domesticates husbandry. We're not quite sure whether cattle or sheep um, because ultimately this idea of mobile pastoralism is largely an argument that is grounded on absence. Okay, in the court at where Horizon we have much less settlement evidence than before and therefore much less animal bone or archaeobotanical evidence. And so this idea of mobile pastoralism is kind of fitted in there um, to, to fill a gap. There is some evidence in the pollen course for landscape opening and so on, so it kind of fits, but it's for many regions not actually proven. Um, we also think that at this point, um, Indo-European languages are introduced. It fits sort of with the dates um, that have been suggested based on linguistic evidence and shared uh, root words. Okay, so as you can see, we have the sort of convenient migration and bit by bit, all sorts of transitions and all sorts of changes are being sort of pinned onto it because it forms this convenient watershed points, even if these changes may not be independently datable uh, in themselves. The only thing we haven't managed to pin on the call that we're so far is lactose tolerance, but we're working on it. Um, and so finally, how could all these people move in, um, you know, and take over Central Europe so easily? Uh, this is also, in a sense, in the, in the traditional model that we've been presented, a bit of a problem. Um, and therefore, it's required so far some kind of catastrophic explanation. Climate doesn't seem to be quite a right fit. Um, so what's being debated right now is that we have um, the appearance of the plague, perhaps, in the uh, nucleated settlements of the Tripilia culture in what is now uh, Ukraine, and that from there, it either spreads just before the cold at horizons and empties Europe uh, of its inhabitants, you know, they all die, um, or that the plague is in fact spread by these migrants and it's, it gives them some kind of competitive advantage. Um, recently, more and more examples of uh, this plague genome are turning up in graves that are much earlier than the migration horizon. So we're not quite sure uh, how this works, um, but so we're still debating um, the timing and the effects of this plague. Um, but again, I think the important thing here is to take away that we're working from an idea that this plague, you know, this, this, this plague would be so catastrophic because these populations were previously not in contact and then a new population appears with a new plague and therefore it empties out uh, the landscape. And the question really is whether that is, is, that is even true. Um, the dominant narrative has been partly so successful uh, because it plays very much also on politics in the present. It's been spread through the press in a series of lurid headlines that amongst others, uh, Kate and I wrote about in our World Archaeology article. Um, it's sort of fitted quite neatly into modern day conceptions about migrations being some kind of crisis, uh, certainly for the populations on the ground that are having to take in or in some way integrate um, a new set of people. Um, and it's also sort of cast the migrants themselves in a very, very destructive role as the most murderous people of all time, um, amongst others. Uh, so the problem with all this, of course, is um, that it encourages very, very simplistic views of migration, namely that everybody's default mode of life uh, is to be sitting still as long as it's possible to be sedentary. Um, and to only move when there is a crisis approaching, whether it be climatic or overpopulation or whatever. And this is, of course, not to deny that these aren't drivers for migration, but it sees very much this sort of, um, you know, th this is the only reason people move. Um, and, and it's sort of an, an, an anti-migrationist stance to begin with. We have our clear borders, we have our nation states, we have our settlements, and anything else is something strange um, that needs to be explained. Uh, very much based on, on modern discourses. Uh, and of course, for archaeologists in particular, um, it's had the, um, the effect of conflating a new DNA pattern, the step signature that the geneticists have, um, have 
you know, come up with um, with cultural behaviors. Okay, sometimes that's even already um, in the terminology. You call something Neolithic DNA versus hunter-gatherer DNA, for example. It's not obviously uh, that you are genetically predisposed to hunt and gather versus to be a farmer, uh, but it becomes, you know, behaviors and DNA patterns become linked in our heads because we use this sort of terminology. And in this case, the step DNA, although it's a geographical designation, they've, they've wisened up and tried to be a little bit more uh, neutral, it's come to be associated with all these new patterns of behavior just sort of by you know, because it is such a convenient turning point genetically, everything else has been uh, added to it. Uh, and of course, the, the main drivers of these social changes are seen to be these warrior males. It's them who make history or prehistory in this case. Uh, so all this has been extensively critiqued uh, archaeologically, uh, especially Martin has written on this, um, that in its initial formulation, uh, there were clear overtones of archaeological models of the of the culture concept that we had long thought we had left behind um, that Gustav Kossiner and to, to an extent Gordon Child had championed in the 1920s that archaeological material culture groups uh, could be equated with what we think are peoples. Um, so uh, identity groups uh, that in themselves uh, have some kind of uh, existence as, as uh, political actors. So these social identities um, are conflated with genetic ancestry, but that only really works today anyway, with a very superficial treatment of the archeological record that works at the very large scale of explanation. And in fact, the initial DNA studies worked at these really large scales, as you can see uh, on this map. Okay, and because that they were looking at Europe as a whole, uh, there was very, very little room uh, to take into account the regional variations uh, and the diversity of the processes that are in fact documented archaeologically. So a hierarchy started to be built in between genetic models that were starting to dominate the headlines in, uh, in the popular press and also in the uh, high impact scientific journals and the sort of bottom up archaeological narratives that were published in hard to access edited volumes and regional languages. Um, and so the, the, this, this critique is sort of come, you know, um, it's, it's taken a time for it to come into its own and to be in internationally a little bit recognized. Um, and of course, we have to use a very stereotypical migration model, certainly at the beginning of this uh, uh, dominant narrative, uh, where we see this idea you know, embodied in the arrow on the map, that there is two static populations not in contact, and then one eventually starts from a defined starting point, moves somewhere, which is its defined end point, where they again sit still. Um, doesn't change its identity at all on the way, interacts with local people on a sort of problematic basis, shall we say, and is in fact a confrontation. Um, so for us on the archaeological side, it's fair to say that when this ADNA revolution first started, uh, there was a lot of scepticism and a lot of, well, hostility perhaps, um, not really because um, of the evidence in itself, but because the archaeological community felt they were being sort of pushed into a corner, that this uh, migration model and this very simplistic model of migration was seen as the ultimate answer to all our questions, and archaeological evidence, in a sense, um, didn't matter and, uh, anymore. Um, we were being bombarded almost weekly by all these new maps and new graphs that showed massive population influx, and it was very, very hard to keep track of this. Um, and, and to keep ahead of the developments and somehow then uh, frame an archaeological response to all this. Uh, however, if you look in the detail, and Martin is going to do this uh, in, in greater detail in the second half of this paper, um, there is, you know, okay, we can't obviously deny migration, nor do we want to deny, nor do we want to deny migration at this point, but there are important changes um, that are taking place that are starting before this horizon of genetic change. Uh, so here's work by Sebastian Schultrich, for example, who's uh, recently finished his PhD in Kiel, that shows that the frequency of battle axes and burials does not actually appear with the core that were uh, at 2800 B or 2900 BC, but in fact peaks before then. Um, so this is, you know, um, a change in burial rite that is already building on previous traditions and doesn't just simply come out of the blue. Um, and similarly, various economic developments uh, towards greater pastoralism, where we do have some evidence for that in some regions. This begins 
some time before the arrival of these step DNA um, genes. So we need to start to think about how we can best combine different strands of evidence, genetic and archaeological, uh, on a more equal footing. And of course, the key point is also to rethink the migration concept in itself. Um, and here, archaeologists themselves, I think, uh, are to blame, certainly in Central Europe, we long denied, uh, well, in Central Europe, we long had migration as a sort of in the back of our heads, but we'd not really had a, a theoretical discussion about how migration would work as a process. Okay, we'd sort of modeled it on um, the early medieval migration period, the Völkerwanderung. Okay, and thought, well, okay, it's attested in classical sources. This is how people, in fact, move, um, you know, uh, taking up, put, putting all their wives, children, and belongings on a wagon um, and moving en masse permanently one way as a close group of people. Uh, and there was this clear position between the people who were sedentary and those that were currently on a migration. Um, but clearly, as we're talking to a group of social anthropologists, you're quite aware that this is not how mobility uh, and migration, in fact, work. Um, and in recent years, smaller scale st studies by, by archaeologists and by archaeogeneticists and by people working with isotopes have already begun to fill in some of this detail, which we were craving um, at the start of this process. Okay, so uh, work by Knipper and by Mitnick and others have shown that even in a small river valley in southern Bavaria, the Lech Valley, um, you could see differences between different sites in exactly who uh, was the most mobile, for example, males or females, who was coming in. Um, it wasn't all just one um, uniform splurge. But I particularly want to draw your attention to a recent paper by Papach and others, where they've looked at uh, Bohemia in a long-term perspective and traced various um, genetic influences um, over a longer time period. And although you still see here loads and loads of different maps with arrows on, the important thing is that these arrows are coming from all sorts of directions now. So if you look more closely, it's less of a wave-like thing. Um, and it's also a constant thing. Okay, there's lots of different time periods where there is small changes, larger changes, darker blue, lighter blue. Uh, and some of these coincide with breaks in the archaeological evidence, and some of those do not. Um, but it's quite clear uh, that we're looking at a, at a period of, of constant change throughout the Neolithic with some tipping point moment. Uh, similarly, Wang et al. in 2019 published a very important paper uh, that further took apart this step ancestry in itself uh, and showed that this is in itself a composite of many, many different origins, including some European Neolithic elements, okay, up to one fifth. Uh, so there must have been not just east-west, but also at some point west-east movement and interaction over a much longer period and presumably over a much wider region to create uh, what we now recognize as step DNA uh, in our samples. And finally, work uh, in the course of our project, mainly by Martin Richards and Eva Fernandez Dominguez, has shown um, that also uh, there is a large proportion of uh, female movement from the steppes into Central Europe, uh, but that this uh, female role is very variable regionally. Um, so there is a very interesting story there uh, in sort of contrasting the big wave-like replacement in the Y chromosomes to the much more patchy picture in the mitochondrial DNA um, that we're currently working through at, at this moment. And in other regions, we see significant continuity uh, in the DNA pool, or rather we see, this is Switzerland, um, and you see uh, that while new uh, genetic signatures do turn up uh, at the beginning of the code it were, there's also local or what was previously Neolithic signatures occasionally popping up in burials for several hundreds of years afterwards. So this transition is not a wave-like one-off, you know, everybody dies scenario, but a much longer period of interaction between, uh, well, separate genetic ancestries, where we now need to investigate in a second step for how long these actually saw each other as different identity groups as well. And all this happens on a background uh, of a much longer millennia long Neolithic tradition uh, of in fact constant movement. Okay, these societies we've classed as sedentary, but all the way from the beginning of the Neolithic in Europe, from the band keramic and so on, we see a whole series of papers, uh, isotopic papers, archeological papers, 
that show that in fact that there is a considerable background mobility of these people and that they were able uh, to maintain um, a lot of uh, contacts over very, very large distances that presumably formed the bedrock uh, of how these migration movements could later even happen. Uh, these weren't just people storming out of the steps out of the blue, but people with whom already there was established contact and who were moving along established routes. Okay, so the typical European Neolithic settlement community isn't a closed uh, little island. Um, they're open and they have fuzzy edges uh, and they're fluid, uh, like many anthropologists have uh, already argued for their own uh, communities. And you can show this uh, not just genetically and isotopically, but also in the archaeological record. Uh, so here is a model of the transmission of pottery technology in the Alpine Foreland by Caroline Heitz uh, and Regine Staffer. Um, and, you know, when they began their study of tracing pottery transmission, um, they were reacting against this model of, you know, local people make pots locally. What they in fact found uh, is that pottery, um, you know, once you split it apart into fashioning technology versus pottery paste recipes versus how the style looks like, then you see there is a lot of interaction. People must be traveling, they're trading, um, you know, they're trading knowledge of how to build up a pot, uh, they're copying stylistic changes off each other. There is pottery that is made locally with local clays but looks entirely foreign. Um, there is pottery that looks entirely locally made but when you see into the details, you notice that it's made according to a different coiling technique that comes from elsewhere, etc. So there's constant interaction in these very widespread communities of practice. So to end my part of the talk and hand you over to Martin, um, there are fundamental changes around about 3000 in the archeological record. There are certainly changes in the introduction of a new single burial ritual and in the introduction of a beaker with corded ware decoration. In how far these uh, are fundamental social changes and other aspects of life as well, like mobility patterns or the economy, we need to look at region by region. It's clear that migration does play a crucial role. There is a big influx of new haplotypes, but we don't know how long this migration process actually lasted. We've been working with the stereotypical image of a wave-like single mass migration of people, but that is certainly wrong, I would say by now. Uh, based on new genetic and on archaeological data. Instead, we see multiple movements that probably are of a quite different nature, that hit different regions at different times, and that have very different effects there. So what we need to do now uh, is to see migration not as the explanation in itself, but as the social phenomenon that we in fact need to understand, um, and to trace it over the longer term uh, and transregionally. And Martin's going to do all that for you now. So... This is it for me. Yeah, thank you, Dani. So in this second part of our uh, presentation, I would like to go into the question of politics, or the politics of migration in prehistory in the third millennium. And I think I would like to start with the observation that if we look at this dominant narrative that uh, Dani was talking about, I think it's clear that first of all, there is not so much explicit talk about politics whatsoever, but it is clearly implicitly in there. But the politics that are being portrayed in this dominant narratives seems to mainly be carried out uh, at a level that is between communities, between communities that are basically seen as themselves closed, clearly bounded homogeneous units or peoples even, but there is really no not much uh, thought or discussion about internal politics, internal conflicts, internal conflict resolution. This has to do, I think, with the image of social organization that is, again, also implicitly um, somehow transported in this narrative. And that is the idea that these groups would more or less be organized in a kind of top-down, individualized male leadership kind of way. So basically a kind of patriarchic chiefdom uh, society. It builds on a lot of gender stereotypes, as uh, Dani has already talked about, and is somehow portrayed as a society that is characterized by bellicosity and a kind of excessive uh, violence, competition between groups, uh, down to the point of extinction of one group uh, in favor of the other. 
It is interesting and also important to note that the ideas, this idea about social organization in the third millennium, this kind of patriarchic male dominated, uh, dominated leadership kind of social organization is not really based on the archeological material themselves. It is more um, coming from a kind of reading of um, Iron Age literature, the so-called Vedic myths that are associated with Indo-European languages. And thus there is this implicit, again, the implicit assumption that they must reflect some kind of pan-Indo-European uh, mode of social organization. If you go to the archeological evidence of the third millennium, um, in Europe, I think those kind of ideas about social organization are much less clear. I mean, there are some aspects of this overall narrative that are clearly identifiable. For example, the emphasis on the individual in burial custom. Some people call it individual aggrandizement. So the fact that you have burial mounds covering individual burials. And this is something, it's not totally new, but it's something that certainly gets much more important in the third millennium. But again, if you then look more into detail and look into the kind of Cordetware, Bell Beaker, Jan Meyer archaeological material, what you see is tens of thousands of burials. And archaeologists have been looking at these burial mounds for decades in order to identify significant differences, uh, social differences that could be expressed in, you know, difference in the elaboration of burial construction, burial mound construction, or also grave good equipment. And it has virtually been never tested. It's very, very significant here that what we see is, uh, we have cases like Flintbeck here, which actually close to Kiel where I work, where we have a kind of field of small, moderate to small burial mounds with individual burials. So we have this kind of pattern that we have high numbers of simple burials, and we have a kind of proliferation of these kind of supposed symbols of elite culture, like the uh, stone axes, uh, the beakers, or also um, um, the flint blades like this. So this is, I mean, speaking rather for a kind of egalitarian politics. I mean egalitarian politics in that sense that we could make the argument that um, there was in like the fourth millennium in the early burial mount uh, of the micro culture, for example, in the Caucasus region, there we did have these small, uh, individualized, larger um, burial mounds with individual burials that were extremely rich. But this is something that somehow disappears throughout the, uh, the, the young layer and then also into the third millennium with Cordoba and Belbiga. This somehow seems to disappear. There seems to be a kind of uh, proliferation of these status symbols that is then very clearly expressed in this kind of uh, large numbers of small and simple burials. Also, this idea about bellicosity and uh, violence is something that is needs to be seen in a much more differentiated way, especially when it comes to the Yamnaya burials, which are often like in this kind of popular images here, uh, portrayed as a kind of main uh, manifestation of this kind of uh, violent warrior type of person. This is something uh, that is really not at all borne out with the archeological record because weapons are really seldom in Yamnaya burials. Again, there are large numbers of these burials. There are a few weapons they are often prominently displayed when it comes to somehow presenting Yamnaya as a kind of overall uh, phenomenon. There's also no direct indication of having higher levels of violence, for example, as uh, trauma that are showing up in the skeletons or something like this. There is, of course, in the late fourth millennium, this kind of new uh, phenomenon that you have is stone stele, which actually often are showing this kind of weapons. It's showing axes, daggers, halberds, bows and arrows, and all these things. But this is not things that you then actually would find. So these kind of weapons are not implements that you would find in the Yamna burials. And also there is no direct connection between these stele and the Yamna burials. You often find them in Yamna graves, but they are being reused from their original position. So they were actually not erected in a kind of direct connection to a kind of um, Yamna uh, burial construction. So they do not seem to represent Yamna associated social values. <clears throat> 
When it comes to cordedware, at least in Central Europe, I think there the kind of connection to uh, weapon and male warriorhood is a little more likely. I mean, already I already talked about this kind of proliferation of these uh, stone axes in cordedware burials. But again, we don't have any indication for a correlation uh, of cordedware with these kind of with le increased levels of violence that would show up in the skeletal material. And also you could really question kind of effectiveness of many of these uh, battle axes, so-called battle axes, when you look at their size and also the kind of uh, size of, or, or the shape of the shaft holes and the thickness of shaft holes and all these things. When it comes to the gender roles, I think there seem actually to be quite a change in the third millennium. John Robb and Oliver Harris recently argued, for example, that starting with cordedware basically so with a third millennium what you do see is this kind of binary gender model that is being represented consistently and also stably and also going into uh, the following bronze age and they argue i think convincingly also that is something that has to be seen in contrast to uh, most uh, periods earlier than the third millennium so that most of the neolithic societies were when you do have a display of gender, gender specific uh, traits, it is more uh, situational, it is not a consistent and re uh, constantly reoccurring pattern. So there seems to be a kind of more, uh, more um, intensive uh, identification of persons with their specific gender. And this binary gender model seems to take hold in this period. But again, here we have to um, differentiate there is a recent article by Olerud in uh, that was published last year, which actually shows if you look into the details of how gender is displayed in these different cordial burials in different regions, there's quite a variation. So there is much more, there's a much uh, more um, differentiated and varied record that we should take into account when we're talking about this kind of new role of a binary gender model in the third millennium. So if we take these archaeological uh, arguments together, I think it is fair to say that with this kind of third millennium migration, with this kind of step impact, there are some, there is a set of ideological traits, maybe, that is most visible in the, these burial, in these new burials of the kind of the Cordesware and the Bell Beakers, partly also in the Amnaya. And one could try to subsume this as um, yeah, a package of ideological traits that include the aggrandizement of individuals, includes a more prominent role of binary gender representations, and also male warriorhood. But then what is really interesting here, I think, and what we want to deal with and also look more closely into is how this actually does impact the Neolithic societies in Europe in different parts of Europe, which is a much more complex story, as we will see. But in order to do this, I think it's important to move away from a perspective on politics as a top-down phenomenon where we are dealing with uh, interactions between groups or between leaders and their kind of uh, um, homogeneous groups and rather focus on the kind of bottom-up agencies, the possibilities for individuals, small groups of political, uh, for political action. So instead of, as Daniel already said, instead of seeing migration as this kind of block-like or even black box event, which somehow changes everything, um, I think we have to see migration as a complex phenomenon that creates politics on multiple scales, on the scale of the settlement, on the scale of the household, on the scale of individual people. So if we think about bottom-up politics in the third millennium in Europe, I think we have to acknowledge that, as we have seen from the recent uh, genetic data, there is an increased movement of people, which then clearly will lead to encounters of people that have that come with or are accustomed to different practices, values, concepts, and so on. And I think it's also reasonable to argue that there probably will be some kind of main tension between the kind of traditional, localized, values, concepts, and practices, and those that are new, transregional, and then connected to 
this hardware uh, science system or the Bell Beaker science system and so on. Uh, but then it is important to look at how this will actually be negotiated at various group levels, household, settlement, or individual. And there is actually a lot of work that has already been done in that respect. And I'll cite here some Dutch scholars, which have a, a very good traditions of actually looking in a very careful and detailed way into the kind of uh, sequence of changes in the third millennium. Here, for example, we have uh, Sandra Beckermann, who uh, published a, her PhD thesis in 2015 about the coastal communities of the Corded Ware in, in the Netherlands. And she shows in a very interesting and also very detailed way how the local, that is Vlading in pottery style, and the translocal, that is Corded Ware pottery styles, are actually gradually inter integrated into local contexts in uh, stratified settlements where we can actually trace this kind of gradual change. She can show, she looks at sites like Kansmaburg, Mienacker and others, and she can show that in most of those cases, there is not a sudden change to be seen, but rather a kind of prolonged side by side or even a merging of traditions. And she looks at different aspects of pottery making technologically, but also typologically when it comes to decoration and shaping of uh, pots. And she shows that these different aspects of pottery making can actually also change with different paces and only over several generations, really uh, the transformation from Vlading and pottery style to um, Cordoba pottery style is then uh, accomplished. If we compare that with other regions, like for example, uh, Switzerland, we can see that the introduction of this new pottery style of Cordoba, as an example, can, uh, can result in a very, in an old spectrum of different outcomes. We can see like in Western Switzerland here, a sudden switch to the new pottery style, abandoning the old one. We can also see a rejection of this new pottery style and just a continuation of the traditional styles uh, for many generations, even centuries. But then also we see, as Bickerman showed, um, the different forms of integration, this kind of gradual transformation that we just talked about, but also, which I find quite interesting, this kind of dual system. I try to represent this here in this graph, a dual system where we actually have, in some of these Dutch sites, but also in other places, we have a kind of situation where we have representative fineware vessels that are carried out in the new cordware style. And at the same time, in the same settlement, we have everyday courseware that is still or continued to be carried out in the more local traditional Vlading and pottery style. And I think it's reasonable to argue that this has to do with a kind of differential um, identification with different uh, social arena or different uh, collectives even. So people have, when it comes to representative fineware, they have the somehow kind of um, urge to identify themselves with this kind of new trans-regional trend with all the ideological values that that might be might encompass. But at the same time, when it comes to everyday uh, use, more or less, they are still strongly rooted in their local collective. Um, and I think this is something um, that is reflecting conscious decisions and conscious um, um, dealings with the kind of problem that exists between this kind of new uh, value systems that are coming into Europe and also the kind of uh, local identities that still are playing their part. Another interesting point is, again done by uh, Dutch colleagues, Klein and colleagues, they have been looking at uh, the use of these pots. And here we can see an interesting decontextualization of these new hardware vessels. Usually they are associated with this kind of alcohol consumptions where they are uh, you know, high prestige sometimes um, grave goods in these new single graves. But in these Dutch settlements, uh, the function of these beakers is adjusted to local needs. So they're used for all kinds of domestic activities. They're used to cook fish soups or stews or everything. It really doesn't matter if the pot is carried out in the new Cordova style or if it is carried out in the new uh, in the old Vladingen uh, style. Another, maybe more striking example of the decontextualization, I think, is 
what Carsten Bentink could demonstrate uh, in his PhD in 2020. Again, a Dutch scholar, he uh, looked at the, at the use wear of these new cord clay associated battle axes, and he could actually find <clears throat> that they were not primarily, not at all, actually used for this kind of uh, fighting activities, but rather they are used to uproot trees, which is really kind of essential uh, task of agriculture. And I think you could argue that this is just a kind of practical mind of such a Dutch farmer. But I think if we think in the lines, for example, of James Scott, then we could also see this as a kind of a conscious political act of actually uh, rejecting or at least uh, opposing the kind of whole ideological package that is bound up with this new kind of battle axe. It's James Scott's word, it would be kind of everyday form of peasant resistance. So it would actually um, take this kind of symbol of elite culture and somehow just, you know, use it for this kind of, for, for your own um, traditional uh, activities. So it basically undermines the kind of ideological value that might be connected to this um, kind of tool. So to bring this a little more on the larger scale again, Corded wear, the same as Velbeke, the same as Jammeyer, is not a distinct social phenomenon as it is often somehow portrayed, especially in this kind of uh, dominant narrative. But we would like to argue that this is basically a summary term for a lot of different outcomes of different local political struggle. You have selective integration, you have transformation or even rejection of some or all elements of this new ideological package. And this is why basically, this is not the greatest of all maps, but I want to show here in this kind of uh, figure that what, what is represented often as the corded way or the bell beaker uh, archeological phenomenon really encompasses very, very different ways in which, um, you know, first of all, it's very different societies with different economic backgrounds. And they are, although they're using similar archeological objects, the way they're using it and what they're using it for might differ very much, as we saw, for example, in the um, example of the axis. So to sum this all up, we would argue that understanding those third millennium transformations that are connected to migration that we have been talking about, first of all, it is important to question our use of modern political stereotypes in the construction of narratives. And second of all, we argued that we would like to concentrate more on bottom-up politics of adaptation, integration, and resistance, because this only enables us to basically see pre-stroke human beings as self-conscious political actors in the same way as we would like to see ourselves like that. Thank you. <laughs>